So the topic today is the future of fishing in the northeast of Scotland. I'm Malcolm Mackay, a solicitor advocate at Brodie's Aberdeen office. I've been with Brodie since May 2011 and for the 10 years before I joined Brodie's I also worked in Aberdeen with my main focus being marine dispute work. A fair bit of that has obviously been fishing related, helping clients with legal issues, particularly contentious or regulatory matters, for instance, ILO 188 work agreements, uh, partnership wrangles, quota disputes, collisions, injuries, vessel losses, and um, sadly, fatalities. I'm also on the steering group of Marine Safety Forum, an Aberdeen-based marine safety non-for-profit organization with worldwide membership. Some of you attending may have been at our previous discussions about ILO 188, and given the recent changes forced upon the sector with Brexit and COVID-19, we thought it would be a good time to look forward together and discuss what is before us and then how we can maximize the opportunities and together overcome the hurdles ahead. I'm very pleased to introduce our excellent panel of speakers today with Elspeth MacDonald, John Watt, Mike Park OBE joining us today. Dealing firstly with Elspeth, um, who I'm sure is known to, to many of you, Elspeth became the CEO of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, the SFF, at the beginning of August 2019. Prior to that, she was Deputy CEO at the Food Standards Scotland from 2015, when it took over the responsibilities previously carried out in Scotland by the Food Standards Agency, the FSA. Elspeth had lead responsibility for Food Standards Scotland's work on strategy and policy. And before that, she spent 14 years with the FSA in a range of roles, including in London, where she led FSA's regulatory and international unit. Elspeth is a science graduate of Stirling and Aberdeen universities and started her career at what is now Marine Scotland's laboratory in Aberdeen. John Watt is managing director of Macduff Shipyards. Macduff Shipyards group employs around 220 employees operating in Fraserburgh, Macduff and Bucky. John has been in the industry for close to 50 years and has also been involved in fishing vessel ownership for about 40 years. Macduff Shipyards offer a full design and build package for new vessels and also refits, repairs and upgrades on existing vessels from 8 metres in length to the large ones in the northeast at 70 metres plus. Macduff can also offer design packages for customers building in other yards. Moving on to Mike Park, OBE. Mike entered the fisheries sector at the age of 18 and this followed a career spanning 30 years of which 25 were a skipper and company owner. Mike now concentrates his energies towards shore-based activities, and Mike is currently Chief Executive of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, a fisheries trade association representing 260 individual vessels and 1,400 fishermen with a collective turnover approaching 250 million sterling. Mike is also Chairman of Bulk Spool Solutions Limited. He also chairs the Scottish Fisheries Sustainability Accreditation Group, the group that drives certification of fish stocks and the Sea Fish Scottish Advisory Committee. Mike is a member of various other industry government initiatives, including fisheries management and conservation, the group instrumental in changing the face of fisheries management in Scotland. Mike is a winner of the WWF International Sustainability Award in 2010, and more recently received a Blue Marine Foundation Award for his part in the recovery of North Sea Cod. Mike was awarded an OBE by the Queen in 2018 for his services to the marine environment. My business partner, sorry, beg your pardon, my business dispute partner, Ken McDonald, is also on hand to keep an eye on the questions as they come in, and he may jump in on any points made in the questions as the discussion unfolds, or otherwise, Ken and I will sweep up your questions at the end. So, the only things off limits today are Brexit, as we're moving on from that, Sensitive vessel pricing questions, which are not appropriate for panel discussion, but may be perhaps addressed to John thereafter, um, and Aberdeen FC or their promoted managerial appointments. So the high level scene is set. We're now post Brexit and very hopefully we're on our way out of COVID-19. So the session today is the look ahead to the next 10 years. And what I'd like to start with as a question to Mike and then I'll walk around the panel is what will the Northeast fishing industry look like in 10 years? And what are the key points to address to get there? And I'll start with you, Mike, please. Uh, thank you for the question, welcome. And thank you to, to everyone who's, uh, who's attending this morning. Uh, obviously, the industry in the Northeast of Scotland has been booming over the last decade, perhaps a decade and a half. 
and that came on the back of the collapse of the fishing sector back at the turn of the century. Thereafter, we de uh, decommissioned 175 vessels. So in recent times, we, we have been booming. I mean, we face a number of hurdles and opportunities post-Brexit, and it's obvious that confidence and business uncertainty are, are two of those, and indeed levels of uh, raw resource. I guess one of the main issues for the sector is how does it contend with efficiency creep? You know, we get better and better at catching fish and that's all good and well so long as we take account of it. And we look at past sort of changes from, from uh, sail to steam, steam to diesel, hydraulics, accurate positioning systems. So as an industry, we're going to have to contend with that over uh, the next few years. And indeed, we're also in the face of some real green NGO scrutiny, we are going to have to take, take, take care of our, our footprint in terms of unwanted catches, uh, et cetera. There is no, you know, no one can doubt the fact that the outcome of the, the Brexit deal, the trade and cooperation agreement wasn't what the industry wanted. And indeed, in this initial period, we do face shortages in terms of the amount of fish we catch. So we need to find a way of dealing with that. And indeed the industry is pretty resilient in dealing with some of these, some of these issues. Over the next five years, I don't think, you know, the annual increase in shares will, will add much certainty to the industry in terms of how it invests, but it will provide some clarity as to what it will look like after that short initial transition period. I think moving forward as a sector, we have to be aware that we are moving into an era where people are very aware of your activities and how you carry out that, that activities. And over the next uh, two to three years, we are going to have to embrace accountability and responsibility uh, and indeed build on those. So we have a number of challenges, uh, as I say, least of all the uncertainty and the confidence. But I think as an industry, we are built of strong stuff. We are full of alpha males and females. And indeed, I'm sure we'll, we'll build a base that we can continue to prosper from and build on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's that, that's that's very interesting. I can see that some of the questions are already coming in, and we'll we'll perhaps sweep around the group first of all, and then we'll we'll start getting into some of the questions that, that have come up. Um, John, from from your perspective, and I appreciate from the point of view of of a man who's who's well, whose company is involved in building vessels, but also as you mentioned in in in, in your your bio, you also have an interest in the vessels. What's your perspective on the on the look ahead? I appreciate it is as difficult as Mike said at the moment, but but for the look ahead for the, the 10 years to come. Well, certainly it's a challenging time at the moment. And fishing vessel is a long-term investment for the future. It's not a short-term, it's not a short-term project. And the I mean there are various options in the fishing. It's so flexible. There are options to change uses for boats and different things. And how it's how I see it at the moment, we're at the bottom of the cycle at the moment. It really is, as Mike says, it's been it's been a it's been a, a good 10 years. But uh, this this next uh, last two or three months has been a challenge, and uh, with the uh, Brexit and COVID and the fix of that coming through, and hopefully things can just start to get better from uh, from now on again. Um, I think something would be important in the short term is is is, is a bit of short term support in the way of a possibly grant funding and assistance on on the uh, on various schemes. There was there was there has been certain schemes that go as last two or three years. And it's been very, very good for uh, upgrading vessels and also for, for uh, providing onshore work and providing a better quality of catch uh, and, and getting the product there in better in better shape than it was before. So that, that has been very good. So a bit of, a bit, a bit of a, a cut list there, a bit of grant funding would be like a cut list to get things moving again. I think that's something we'd like to get uh, going quite quickly, help to get the industry in a better place. At the end of the day, it's all about the bottom line and what the, we all get, we're living directly or indirectly out of the code end and it's, it's about the bottom line, but also providing a better workplace and a better environment for our own fishermen to go to sea in and making the job better because it, it is, we all remember, especially us guys that are spend most of our time on the land, it's a very, very tough job and it's trying try to uh, make the, the, the lives of our fishermen better. And, and, and getting more young people into the job, make, making it more attractive, getting the returns better. That's what we are hoping. This is just a blip at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can, we can go ahead 
uh, really in the next 10 years and, and build this industry back to where it, where it actually should be. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting and, and, a, and an interesting point. I mean, certainly if you compare the vessels that, I, that I've been on, um, and I appreciate that, that that you you three have probably been on far more than I, but there is certainly a, a, a huge variance in, in in relation to the the style of vessels, and and the more modern ones are certainly a, a lot more comfortable and, and 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 easier for the for the crews to deal with. Also, an interesting point that you made there, John, in relation to the the grants, and I see that we have got a question about that, which I think we'll come to in a moment. But first of all, El Elspeth, maybe we can we can hear from you in relation to your view of the the ten year look ahead and. What do you think the the, the industry will, will have to, to deal with by way of challenges in that in that 10 year period? Thank you, Malcolm, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak on this panel today. Um, I very much agree with uh, much of what, what Mike and John have said. And I think whilst this is about looking forward, I think we do have to look back um, slightly before we look forward because I think we can't get away from the fact that whilst uh, you said at the, at the head of this that, you know, Brexit's a bit off limits, Brexit essentially does set the context for how the industry moves forward uh, in, the, in the short and the long term. So I think we have to do that look back before we do look ahead. And, and I think, as Mike said, you know, the industry had hoped for a much better outcome from the Brexit negotiations than, um, than was achieved. But, you know, that's the hand we've been dealt and, and, and that's what we have to work with. Um, I think it's important to understand that there will be probably quite different challenges in the in the short and medium term and in the longer term because of the way that the Brexit deal works. We've got a very uh, probably sort of limited amount of uh, flexibility and scope over what's known as this adjustment period for the first five and a half years of the deal. And I think that will... Um, you know, that, that's going to be quite a constraint in terms of the, the fishing opportunities that the fleet will have. And there's the prospect of being able to change that um, in 2026 and, and move to perhaps a, a different type of relationship with, with the EU um, that, again, could provide um, better opportunities for the fleet. But, you know, that's some way off and, and there's a lot of bridges that we have to cross to get to that point and, and that won't be without its own challenges and we have to think too about what the, the political landscape will be at, at that time. I think the other thing that is, that there's a couple of things I think are very um, positive though um, as a consequence of the changes. I think the UK is now an independent coastal state and we have a very different relationship now with our um, fisheries neighbours, so our, the Norwegian colleagues for example, the Faroese, the EU itself. So I think where, um, where previously the UK um, you know, had to take part in international fisheries negotiations as part of the EU, we're now at the table in our own right and able to speak uh, with our own voice. And uh, I think that will be uh, advantageous for our fleet and, and helpful for the future. Um, and I think to the, the other the other benefit that does come from, from leaving the common fisheries policy is that we are now able to determine our own fisheries management regime for the UK to, to, to suit uh, what works for our waters and for our fleet. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot to do there. There's, uh, there's a, new, a new legal framework for the industry um, through the Fisheries Act that uh, was established uh, last year. That sets out a whole set of objectives and principles for fisheries in the UK. And there, there's much there that I'm sure we'll be talking about today, about sustainability, about um, climate change objectives, about um, you know, how, we, how we reduce you know, bycatch and, and unwanted catch, et cetera. So I think there's, there's a great deal in the future legal framework uh, that, that will allow the industry to, to develop and evolve. But I think fundamentally in terms of um, opportunities for the fleet, it is going to be tough uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. Um, as I say, this, the, the outcome of these negotiations was, was not what we had hoped for. But I think, as Mike said, this is an industry full of resilient people and people who have dealt with uh, very tough times uh, and, and good times in the past. So I think uh, we certainly want to see people um, you know, keep faith in the industry and, 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 and stick with it and, and you know, continue to prosper because we yeah. are um, you know, producing a, a great product that, that people want to, to buy and to eat. Yeah, I mean, just, just in relation to the, 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 
a point you made there about continuing to prosper and also looping that back to what John was saying earlier about getting some support. We have had a, a, a query in which is, or, or rather an observation, which is, um, which has been put forward by, by Mr. Buchan um, saying what is required is infrastructure capital investment grants to help build up and make this a good industry to work and build a career in. Um, now, I appreciate given the, the COVID issues that there have been certain areas within the, the sector which have had more support than others. And um, what, what's your view, first of all, Elspeth, in relation to um, further government grants or, or such like? Do you think that's on the horizon um, or what, what's your view? Well, certainly there has been government support to the industry uh, during the COVID pandemic. And I think that has been um, extremely welcome for, for those sectors that were able to, to benefit from it. As, as you mentioned yourself, Malcolm, not everybody was eligible for it. And, and I think that's always the nature of, of those sorts of schemes is that they're, um, you know, they don't reach everybody. Um, but there was support made available from the Scottish government and the UK government, both uh, probably about a year ago uh, when the pandemic first hit us. And, and again, indeed more recently when the export problems Co combined with COVID at the start of this year uh, were, were very difficult. I think, however, you know, that, that sort of funding in terms of, if you like, um, almost emergency situations sits slightly separately from the, the ongoing support and, and, and assistance that, that the industry might require. And, and previously, many parts of the industry would have benefited from the EMFF, the European uh, Maritime Fisheries Fund. And of course, the, in the post-Brexit landscape, the governments are now looking at what different types of support will be available for the industry. We know that there's a fund available launched by the Scottish government for the year ahead. Um, that's just been open for expressions of interest. So I think it's very important that that sort of infrastructure support uh, continues to exist to allow the industry not just to get through what might be quite difficult times uh, in the short term, but really allow us to grow and develop for the longer term. Yeah, I mean that's 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 um, that's very helpful, and I think it's interesting the the distinction that you drew there between the short term emergency COVID support, for example, for particularly for the the prawn fleet and such like, and then you compare that to this um, a more sustained um, investment. Um, and I think that's probably what what the what the what the individual um, was, was getting at with regard to infrastructure capital investment, and I guess uh, that longer term view. Um, for the for, for the future, Mike, do you have any observations upon that about additional grants or additional fundings or or such like or other other means that the the, the industry could be gearing up in that in that way? I, I'm old enough, Malcolm, to remember the old Fioga grants that kind of finished, and I guess John is as well that finished away back in the 1980s, and they pumped a tremendous amount of money both into the catching sector and indeed the shore sector and the port sector, the ports as well. You know, in terms of the catching sector, that almost led to the overfishing because we exponentially up built up the fleet in the back of the guide uh, outburst, which meant we fished the stocks down. But essentially, the onshore didn't suffer from that same issues. And I firmly believe that as a sector, we're not a big sector, but we tend to operate in silos. We continue to look at the offshore sector, where people like Jimmy Buckin and others look at the onshore sector. But we are inextricably linked. Without the onshore sector, the offshore sector can't, can't prosper. There is an argument the onshore could by, by sourcing overseas, but I think that doesn't take away from the fact that if we are to deliver a vibrant fishing industry, then the government basically has to step up to the mark and either you know, provide the funding or provide sources whereby we can you know, access that funding to get on and build that, that infrastructure. Because without the shore-based infrastructure, we just become a market with fish landed and trucked overseas. And I'm not entirely sure that's what we had in the vision when we talked about the sea of opportunity. Yeah, understood, understood. Um, John, I mean, from your perspective, you were the one who raised the, the, the initial point about additional support and, and so forth. And um, I'm not sure if you'll, you'll, you'll own up to, to knowing these, these historical grants that, that Mike's referring to. Um, but did you have anything in mind when you were suggesting in, in your earlier point about grants and additional support? Uh, well, I'm, I'm in trouble with all this one in the panel here, but uh, well, um, there's a question about that. Um, <laughs> grant, the grant funding, I mean, back in the 70s, uh, um, basically, the owner had to provide 25% of the cost or, or cover 25% of the cost of the ship. Seafish provided a 25% uh, loan, a grant. 
and then a 50% loan. And then the Fioga grant came in from Europe to go against the loan, it was outstanding. So, I mean, these boats were very, very easily paid. Some of them, some of them were paid very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a great way to get youngsters started in the industry. And I, I mean, I see it as an older person. I see that's one of the issues at the moment. There's a lot of young people in the industry. So, I mean, when I, when I left school, I mean, the, the, you could earn multiples. Uh, uh, what you could earn, I'm sure, going to see it. It's a very tough job. It's a hard job. It's a great job. Again, I've, I've, I've spent a wee bit of time at it myself. It's a super job. But yeah, I really have to get the rewards. It's, it's trying to get the rewards back to the youngsters, to get the youngsters into the industry, to try and get uh, more, more focused on their own people, younger people getting into the job and making a career out of it. That's, that's really the long term thing. That's the key to the industry, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, that brings us on quite well to the next point, which is what do the panel think the fleet will look like? And, and by that, I'm not necessarily just meaning, meaning what what, what are the vessels going to look like? Although that, that's obviously going to be part of it. So, you know, what, what do we expect in relation to the size of the vessels? Um, what do we expect in relation to ownership of the vessels? Do we think they will be Scottish owned in traditional fishing partnerships or do we expect there'll be greater corporate involvement or will there be more foreign ownership going forward? What's your, what's your view there, John? Well, I think the strength of the Scottish industry in the past has been the partnership vessels, and it's still a very, very strong sector. There, are, there is there is room for uh, more corporate uh, business as well, but I mean, uh, certainly the, uh, the partnerships in the north of Scotland here and Shetland has been very, very strong. I think that would be great to see that continuing. Uh, the, the, I mean, get, get forward the fleet profile. Uh, the UK has got a tremendously diverse fleet. I mean, we've got we've got the uh, seven meter long single handed boats worth about 20,000 uh, 20, pounds, and you're, you're up to 70 metre pelagic trawlers that are probably worth 40 million plus. Boats of all shapes and sizes in between, in between these two sizes. You've got steel, timber, wood, one or two uh, ferrous cement ones. You've got zero uh, brand new boats, the boats that are 50 years old and, and older. So it's a tremendously uh, diverse fleet. And I think that's really a great thing for the industry as well. My business, we try to run a, a quite a diverse business. We, we get involved in fish farming, creating higher profiling uh, in different bits and pieces. And, and, and what you find is always some sector are doing better than others. And it's the same with the fishing. And the great thing about a fishing boat, you can move it from one sector to the other. You can, you can target different species, uh, albeit uh, subject to quotas. Yeah? Um, and that's a great positive thing for going forward. We have to remember the decommissioning scheme is might as Mike touched on, and, and how I saw it working, the first two schemes, I think, took out a lot of uh, boats that were tired and older boats, which, which tidied up the harbours to a great extent. But the last one really hit the nail on the head because it took out the more efficient vessels, the higher earning ones. And what I think, the back of that, you land it with a fleet of old boats and new boats. Um, it took, you took out the middle-aged boats out of the fleet, which, is, which has been a real uh, downer, I think, for the industry. Took out a, a, some absolutely fantastic ships. Uh, was scrapped, maybe less than ten years old. Some it was. It was just a. It was just absolutely a crying shame with how that last day scheme uh, uh, came about. And we're thinking about the Murray Thirty or sort of local area. There's a great fleet of under twelve meter boats, under tens, under twelves. Um, these are quite small boats working with one or two guys on them. And they're getting a good enough living on them. But a lot of these boats are 40, 50 years old as well, very old, tired. Um, MC are looking close up these old boats now. Now, because some of these guys that have placed, placed these uh, smaller boats, you're speaking about half a million. And it, it, it's a kind of thing, these figures are just out of the, uh, it's impossible yeah. for these guys to raise this kind of finance to replace this sector of the fleet. And they're limited to these sort of day boats. Uh, again, obviously, once you're a day boat, you're limited to who you can sell your catch to, small catches. Uh, so that, that's the small sector of the boats. We've also got an aging fleet of pair trawlers, uh, like a Mike would have had himself, um, and, and their Cumberland 87s and Miller's boats, all nice super boats. But they're all 40 years old, pushing 40 years old. So uh, they're, they're getting uh, uh, still good boats, but they're getting nearer the end of their life. Okay? And on the other side, we've got a fleet of fairly modern uh, pair trawlers. Uh, what uh, I would class as a more versatile kind of boat, up to 27 metres long, under the 24 metres BP. 
So, so you can pair trawl with a single boat trawl, twin rig trawl, and just for a, basically a, a mixed fishery. Uh, they can also freeze prawns as well. This seems to be the most popular class of boat at the moment. Look at under 24 meters, uh, a boat that can, it can target quite a few different jobs. And then you've got the, 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 the fancier boats, the stern trawlers, the, the purpose built pair trawlers. They go up a different, into a different league. They're far more expensive to build. And they're guys that would need more quota of a specific uh, species if they're building these, uh, like the 34 meter, 30 meter stern trawlers. They're looking for a, a, a fair heap of quota. Well, the ones with the smaller boats can maybe shop around and spend a bit of time at squid and prawns and different things and try and manage things uh, in that way. So, well, it's a fairly it's a fairly diverse industry. So uh, going forward, I, that's what we see the trend for at the moment is as a boat trying to keep the cost down, but a boat it can hit a number of different uh, different targets. Uh, as one or two issues as well we're facing in the future on the technical side, the the industry has, has sort of sleepwalked into the demise of the sea fish survey side. Um, this is something it didn't come as a surprise to us, but it. It's a real issue because sea fish emerged from the White Fish Authority and the Herring Industry Board way back in the 60s and then became the Sea Fish Authority in the 70s. They had a fantastic set of building rules for ships, uh, which is which has now been adopted by the MCA. And if the sea fish used to give you a, like a fee, a 20 grand or 30 grand or whatever to survey your vessel, and, and they did it and they made a good job of it. Now we've passed on this mantle to the MCA and now they're on an hourly rate and, and it's a completely new ball game eh, for the yards and for the MCA. Mm -hmm. The other option is to build a ship in class, which the Lloyds are BV and that's the eh, costs involved in that are horrendous compared to just a yeah. normal build. Another thing about a build as well, the boats are getting more eh, complicated really all the time. Um, we, we had a series of 20 meter wooden vessels. Now, I think I think I built 30 of them, and there's still probably 15 to 30 of them still going, or maybe 20 to 30 still going, uh, all off the same set of templates. Now, if we design a new steel boat, we on average get about two and a half boats out of that design. So the total design parts could be 200,000. So you're, you're, again, you're, you're pushing up the cost of the design and you're pushing it onto the it all goes on the, the, the bottom line cost of the ship. So design is getting more expensive. Um, survey is going to be more expensive going forward, whether we're MCA or if we go to, to Lloyd's or BV, it will be seriously, seriously more expensive to build a ship to that. Mm -hmm. And we've also got tier three emissions looking down, we're looking, we're looking down the barrel of tier three emissions as well for engines and stuff like that. So it, a new vessel is always, a, it's always great to get a new vessel. I mean, we've refurbished boats 30 years old and turned them around and made them almost, uh, not quite so good as new ones, but getting back into quite, quite an efficient uh, working platform. But I think the Northeast Pelagic guys were the, were the sort of prime example of that. They had, they had the, from the 70s on, they lengthened them once, twice, some of them were lengthened three times, new sterns, they heightened them. And as long as they're taking their quota, they could never see the way to build new ships. Whereas the guys in Shetland would have been building uh, new ships. And then, of course, the, the Northeast guys have now caught up with this and they see the benefit of having a new ship. So it, it, mm -hmm. it's obviously benefits of having a new ship, but it's uh, it's the initial cost. It's a challenge getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting what you're saying, particularly about the, the, the small Murray Firth fishermen and the, as you say, the capital injection that they would need to actually replace a, a vessel um, and it, it is, I mean, coming back to what you were saying earlier about grants and, and how can you actually perhaps stimulate that and, and help these guys going forward and I, I touched earlier upon ILO 188 and obviously that doesn't apply to these small vessels at, at, at least at this stage but there will obviously be more regulatory things that are potentially going to come come through on, on that front. Um, what do you think um, in, in, in relation to the, the, the actual dynamic of the of the fleet um, uh, Elspeth, what, what do you think by way of, of changes, by way of vessel ownership and such like, do you think there's going to be much change in, over the next 10 years? Yeah, no, I, th I think maybe pointing back for a moment to my, my answer to the first question, I, I think we're in a period of quite significant change. You know, we've had the probably the sort of biggest um, change to the the landscape for the industry for a number of years. So so I think we have to see how, how that 
actually begins to pan out. It's, it's very early doors. We're only, what, the end of three months from, from this change in terms of leaving the EU, leaving the CFP, a whole different, um, whole different landscape for the industry as we go forward. So I think it will be, um, it will be really interesting to see how that develops. And I think, you know, John gave a, a great account there of just how diverse the industry in Scotland is. And, and, and that is, again, very much reflected in the membership of the Federation. The Federation is quite often, uh, I think, thought of as, as being just full of, um, full of the bigger vessels, but that's not the case at all. We have, um, we have, around about 450 vessels within the membership of the Feder within the associations that are part of the Federation. And, and those range from really very small, you know, inshore boats up, up to the, the big pelagic trawlers that, that, that John spoke about and, and the, the whitefish and, and shellfish fleets too. So really diverse and, and I think um, reflective of just how, how, how diverse our sector is, even in our relatively small country. I think it's important to think for a minute too about, about the fleet in the context of, of the people in it, the sort of human side of the fleet, if you like. And I, I agree with John um, in terms of, you know, how do we encourage younger people into the industry? I grew up in a, in a fishing community on, on the West Coast. Um, and a lot of certainly the, the, the lads that I would have been at school with would have, would have gone fishing. Um, but, it, you know, as, as we were saying, I think earlier, it's, it's quite... You know the barriers to entry into the industry are, 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 are possibly quite high for anybody wanting to get their own boat um, so you know how do we encourage more young people into this industry how do we make it an attractive industry for them and maybe how do we encourage more, more women into the industry there are a lot of women involved with the industry like myself and in, in, in lots of lots of roles but wouldn't it be great to see more women in a, in a wider range of roles uh, across the sector and I think the other thing, thinking about the, um, the human side of the fleet, um, large or small, inshore or offshore, whitefish, pelagic or shellfish, we certainly want to see a, a safe fleet with well-trained people crewing them. You know, it is intrinsically a risky industry. It's doing a dangerous job in off, often dangerous, difficult circumstances. So um, I think certainly as, as, the, as the fleet evolves and as technology evolves, you know, safety is a, is a critically important part of that. Uh, we do a lot of work in the Federation around safety and training and trying to make this industry, you know, as safe as we can, recognising that, uh, you know, there are inherent risks around it. But how can we minimise and, and, and prevent uh, accidents? Um, you know, I think that, again, is part of how you, how you attract people into the industry, how you, how you make it an attractive job for people to go into and, and, and an industry that people want to invest in is that it's, it, it's, um, you know, it's essentially a, as safe as it can be and, and that the people working within it are all well trained and, and well qualified for the roles that they do. So I think we're at a, you know, we're at a, different, a difficult time for the industry in terms of the, the way things are going to play out over the next couple of years and it will be I think um, just re really yeah but I think very interesting to see what sort of dynamics that that starts to to drive in in the way that the fleet responds to it. Mm, that's very interesting and um, particularly in relation to the the getting more women into the industry and I think everyone would be before that and also from the safety side I mean as I mentioned in, in at the start, I've, I've been involved in fishing incidents since the early 2000s, and there has been a, a significant shift in relation to, for example, the use of personal flotation devices and, and so forth, and it's just a lot more accepted. And I think um, in the nearly 20 years that I've been dealing with that, I've seen a, a huge movement, and I think you're right. I think, um, and obviously I know um, Derek and, and others in your team who are promoting the safety really well within the SFF. So, I'm sure that will continue and, 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 and hopefully it will address what, as you said, is a, unfortunately a, a risky vocation and, and it's just a case of trying to, to, to minimise the risks to as low a level as, as possible and, and when you can't lower that risk anymore, you, you have protective measures to try and mitigate the damages. So, um, but yeah, as you, as you say, it is, unfortunately, sadly, there's, there's, there still are the, the losses. And um, Mike, what's your view on the composition of the fleet and changes to vessels and such like? What do you what do you see coming in the next ten years? I tend to think um, I, I agree with a lot of what John said, but I think the value of the quota in relationship to the ship now will mean that some of the composition 
of the of the vessel ownership will change. I personally believe that you will now see some well-established families consolidating with other families to, make, to ensure that they've got the raw resource because you can have the, the shiniest, biggest, polished vessel in, in, in the sea, but unless you have the resource in terms of the quota to, to allow that to make money, then I think you'll always, always have an issue. And I think the, the value of the quota now in relationship to the value of the vessel will mean that that trumps all. And I don't think some people will have the access to the funding to be able to allow them to purchase more quota to keep that business afloat the way it is. And that's where I see some consolidation uh, between vessels as opposed to each building a new vessel, they consolidate down. So I see that uh, as a natural progression over time. You still will have the family sort of basis of the business, but I think at the edges, you will see well, what, I've, what I've explained. We are already seeing some quota being sold off as a result of the post-Brexit deal. Vessels just obviously don't have enough, and that is reaching its way to the deepest pockets. We're seeing that go north to the islands and some of the some of the pelagic interests. So we are already seeing that. So you know that's that's a shift in the structure of the sector like we've never witnessed before. And I think we will have to accept that we will change, and we need to move to the point of economic efficiency because if we don't then uh, we will we will tend to fail. And indeed, in terms of the employment, like every other sort of dirty industry, we are suffering greatly. Way back in the 70s, 80s, the amount of young people leaving school and, and looking for jobs in dirty industries was you know, far greater in significance than it is currently. Most people leaving school now want to go to university or college, or they want to sit at a table with a laptop. So we are suffering more from that as an industry than probably most others. And that's why now we are 25% dependent on non-UK uh, crew. The other thing is that, you know, it's a way back in the 70s and that before we fished in areas like Iceland and various other places. And it may well be in terms of satisfying the market that we start looking at building vessels with freezing capacity. So that if we do fish in Greenland, Iceland, or indeed North Norway, that we have the builds to be able to provide the market with a different product because just saturating the auction market doesn't solve the problem if indeed you can up your own price. So I think we will need to look at that and that will take investment. And it's interesting, while I was talking about Fiat Fioga grants earlier, when I, when I built my first new vessel, I built that with the aid of uh, ship mortgage finance, which meant that you could get access to finance ordinarily, you wouldn't get, get elsewhere, and that was government backed. So, there's perhaps an interesting parallel with what we need now to what went on then. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it, it ties in to some degree with what we we're discussing earlier about the potential for grants, but then maybe if there are other means of, of securing, securing investment, perhaps with some sort of government supported loans or, you know, and, and you're discussing there as well about the quota, the quota points as well. I mean, we have got one question that's come in on, on the quota from Bill Smith. Um, and you'll have seen the, the question there, Mike, where, where he's raised um, the, the, the query in by trilateral negotiations um, and the, the current FQA system. Um, I mean, it is, a, it is a, a thorny issue in relation to the actual levels of quota, which, which are around. And as you say, that's going to probably be the limiting factor. But um, what's your, what are your thoughts on, on I mean, that? Qu quota now is the largest asset in the industry. More often than not, people borrow money against the value of their quota. And government understand that if you were to, you know, deconstruct the, the worth of that quota, then in many parts of the industry, it would find itself insolvent. So I think governments and parties understand that. And I don't think the recent reallocation in a different way from the traditional uh, FQAs is any way to try and destabilize that. I think we need to understand that. But remember, the country voted for Brexit and everyone, to some respect, deserves to get a share of the spoils. And I think that's the sort of point that the government has taken on board, that they should use some of the additional quota, uh, allocate in a different way and try and get it to different people so that they can you know, allow new entrants or create new entrants or whatever, or community schemes. And I think it's almost the first step on that pathway, but I don't think it's any intent by the government to deconstruct the current traditional way of allocating opportunities to the fleet. Mm -hmm. Right, that's that's um, that's a useful answer. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, Elspeth, we've touched on this, or you've come to this very briefly, I think, in one of your your earlier answers. Um, 
one thing which I was also keen to get your and the, the panel's input on is what changes do we see coming with ethical considerations? And by that, I'm thinking about perhaps development of Marine Stewardship Council, uh, food miles, carbon in the catch, um, more local sales, et cetera. Um, and Mike, I think, touched upon earlier about perhaps a, a change in species and, and perhaps looking for, for, for different, different types of catch. What are your thoughts in relation to that over the next 10 years? What do you perceive coming? I think there's a great deal of focus now uh, in the industry and probably has been growing for a number of years. Some of the things that, 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 that Mike's touched on uh, in particular, I think, um, point to that. In terms of just that um, recognition of the, if you like, I suppose, the, the, the three pillars of sustainability and, and, and how the industry has to deliver against all of these. So looking at the economics uh, sustainability, obviously, of, of the sector. Uh, the social sustainability of it in terms of the, the, the communities that, that depend upon it and also the environmental sustainability and I think you know Mike spoke about the perhaps of boom and bust activities of a few decades ago when um, you know there was overcapacity in the fleet and, and the stocks were badly affected as a consequence we've come a long way since then and uh, you know there is a, the, there's a, a much a much rosier picture now in terms of the, the biological sustainability of our stocks, although obviously with some um, there are still issues and there are still challenges. And I think related to all of that, um, we need to have a very um, well resourced and well founded um, system of science to underpin our understanding of, of our stocks. Um, I, I'm sure many of you. Uh, dialed in today will um, you know be conscious of the fact that there's been a lot of publicity about the very alleged very poor state of the cod stock in the North Sea now there certainly are challenges with relation to cod in the North Sea and and, and much of that um, may indeed be due to climate change for example and the fact that many species are migrating north and, and cod is one of those but you know we we feel that the the science that underpins the North Sea cod stock modeling hasn't kept up with the way in which the climate has probably driven some of that shift in the cod stock so so you know we have to look at these things pretty carefully and, and not just necessarily take things at face value in terms of well gosh there's hardly any cod in the southern north sea it must be due to fishing uh, that's not necessarily the case and i think there are a lot of factors that we need to look at for the future to understand the way in which um, stocks are changing and um, and species are on the move. Um, certainly in, in the Federation's uh, work, this is a, a really critically important part of what we do. We, um, we published just earlier this year an environmental policy statement that sets out a lot of the work that we are doing um, through the Federation and through the, uh, through the associations that make us up, and including Mike's and, and others, in terms of what we're doing to try and improve things like gear selectivity, for example, um, looking at um, what, what the industry can do in terms of generating data and scientific information to help uh, greater understanding. Um, very much, um, we're very much engaged with government in designation of things like marine protected areas. And there are always pressures uh, on the industry in relation to space, you know, can we the industry can't just fish anywhere. You have to fish where the fish are going to be and where the, where the stocks are. Um, so we've worked very closely with, um, with the government to make sure that in designating marine protected areas that, that fishing has been taken into account and, and that we are able to um, you know, have really constructive discussion with government about um, the need for conservation of marine habitats and features and species. But that um, has to be for the you know, to try and balance the objectives of both and not to exclude one uh, at the cost of the other. I think the issue about food miles and, and carbon footprint is really interesting and really important. Um, and actually, when you look at uh, uh, Scottish fisheries and you see the very short, short food miles and the short food chain that we can have, you know, I think there's, there's great opportunity there. And I think lots of, lots of businesses this past year, when there have been restricted markets abroad due to COVID restrictions, I think a lot of businesses have become involved in direct selling, for example, and I think that's probably been very successful for some. Uh, and I think lots of people like to know exactly where their food has come from and, you know, out of the sea and onto their plates pretty quickly. 
there's been some science done around the, the carbon footprint of um, commercial fish stocks. And I think some of our pelagic stocks have got like, an extremely low carbon footprint. Um, and, you know, those are the sorts of considerations that, that many members of the public are taking into account now in their decisions on, on what they eat and what they buy and, and, and what they want to support. So, so I think um, ethics, sustainability, um, however you, whatever term you use, these are, I think, um, fundamentally important to the industry as we go forward. And again, I think I said at the outset, the Fisheries Act, which was, um, which came onto the statute book at the end of 2020, has a set of, I think it's uh, eight principles. And I think about five of these link if, in some shape or form to, to sustainability and things like climate change. So very much at the, at the, at the centre of what we do. And I think a, a, a growing recognition um, that, that we have to be uh, very cognizant of that um, as we go forward. Thank you very much, Elspeth. That was, a, that was a really good answer. Thank you. Mike, I spotted you scribbling some notes there. Um, do you have any observations beyond what, what Elspeth has, has flagged up? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to, to, to basically reiterate what, what Elspeth has said, but everything she said is, is sound. Uh, as an activity, we are under constant scrutiny. And I think you just have to look at the, the Seize Piracy film that's now been running on Netflix. And you can see that uh, there are some, I guess, untruths out there just to try and harm the industry. And it's interesting that a lot of other sectors of science, et cetera, have come out in condemnation of that. Uh, you know, we are aware now that the, 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 house, the housekeeper uh, is now looking at social issues in terms of, you know, how they buy their product, where it comes from, food miles, carbon footprint. Although luckily for us, I guess, in some respects, is that most fish is now, like other products, is, is, is bought on price point. So it only, it only holds the argument so far in terms, in terms of the sort of social environmental aspects of it. But there's a number of, of issues that feed into... To, to the question that was raised. And, you know, safety at sea is one of them, ensuring that the people who operate in the industry are, are uh, protected. It's a, the treatment and, and well-being of, of all crew, not just foreign crew. You know, I reiterated earlier on that, that I think we have around about 900 non-UK crew operating in Scotland. So it's important that we make sure that, you know, they have a voice, they can be heard, and they're treated well, and their well-being is taken care of. As the ILO Work and Fishing Convention, we have to ensure that that is followed this fish welfare, uh, that's now becoming a popular discussion that we have been we have been brought into more and more. And it's interesting that, that well, to hear John's views actually, that the more modern vessels, I guess vessels that are built from here on in, will have to take rec or have recognition of the fact that fish welfare is becoming uh, a real issue for us. But underpinning everything we do is the sustainability of the stocks and ensuring that we only harvest the yield rather than the capital in terms of the fish we take from the sea will be important. At the end of the day, we have a saying in the industry, it all comes out to the core end. And without fish in the sea, you can't make money and you can't build on business and you can't create that certainty uh, that we need. Certification of stocks is another. And as a sector in Scotland, we are pretty much focused on that, both in terms of demersal uh, and, and pelagic. But you'll remember two words that I, I mentioned early on in this, this chat, and it was accountability and responsibility. And I think at the end of the day, the industry has to step up to the mark and make sure that we are accountable and responsible for every action we take or plan. And that will be that will be key for us as an industry uh, going forward. Yeah, that's that's um, that's interesting. I think it ties in a few points, actually, um, that that uh, that Elspeth was making. And also, I, I, I like the point that you made there about the safety and the. Uh, and, and that becoming a factor as well for the effectively for the welfare of of the crews and so forth. And John, you actually touched upon that earlier, I think, in one of your your earlier points about making it a more appealing place for young people to go to work and and older people to go to work and, and having better um, better facilities and, and and better vessels, more modern vessels with with, with better better kit on board to to work with. Um, I was also interested, and I, I kind of know the answer to this already, but any ideas about any further changes we might see coming? Is there is there scope for a hydrogen vessel to be built in Macduff in the next 10 years? Well, I'm, I'm quite a practical person. I'm not just dealing with things on the ground at the moment. In this stage, tier, tier three emissions is the big one to hit us this year. Every new ship that's ordered up now is going to meet tier three emissions, which means exhaust scrubbers, bad blue, et cetera. 
not only that, it also means any reed power has, has got to meet it as well. Uh, so if it, I've tried to meet it, if you put an engine into your boat, instead of a tier two engine, you've got to put a tier three. Now, it, on a just very rough figure, a 70,000 pound engine, will, this will double the cost of the engine. Mm -hmm. If you've got two engines and you ship, uh, small engines, uh, 40,000, it'll go to 100,000 with scrubbers on it. So there's, there's certainly big financial implications with this uh, tier three. Um, it is, I think, I think there is some scope if you can't actually physically fit it in, in your old boat, you, you, you'll get away with a tier two engine, or you or you can put in like for like, you can put in a, the same engines you've already taken out, but an old one reconditioned. So I can see this a backward step. If you can't fit a, a tier three, you've got to go and put in an old, you can you can e easily put an old fashioned engine at the, it's not the emissions friendly. So that's a big one that's going to hit the industry. Uh, about the carbon footprint, I mean, when I started, when I started work, I mean, you would have been, you would have been putting a 500 or 600 horsepower engine into a vessel, uh, burnt 120 liters per hour, and you're looking at three tons bullet pool, maybe three and a half. Now we, we are trying to get 12, 13 tons out of the same fuel burn and the same horsepower. So it's probably a fact that I, I put at least three. Uh, so okay, that's what's really pushing development of fishing vessels all the time. We're trying to get trying to get sort of more bangs for your box and get more get more uh, uh, efficient engines, better propulsion systems so you can burn less fuel. Fuel has been cheap but it's going back up again. So I mean at the end of the day cost the cost of fuel is a big driver. It just comes right off the bottom line as well. So it's important to try and get the fuel burned down uh, for emissions and for and for in, in, environmental concerns and also for the bottom line. Um, we spoke about hybrid, we've touched on that. So I, I think perhaps the Scottish government would be the best place to advise on hybrid at the moment. We're building two ferries down in Ferguson and Glasgow, and I think we're up to uh, quite small ferries. I think we're up to 200 million or something for the two ferries. Uh, so it's a, I really don't think there's much of a place for hybrid at the moment in the fishing industry. Uh, it, it's for folk with deep pockets to investigate these things and see if perhaps in the future, I've got a cousin that runs a, 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 a skipper of ferry from the uh, sky to Rassi, and it, it's a hybrid ferry and it's absolutely fantastic, but it's a 20 minute run. So unless you're doing that kind of runs and efficient, and say the hybrid is, is not really an option at the moment, as I say, unless you've got very deep pockets, but technology will move on and there may be, there may be options for that in the future. There's probably an option at the moment for instead of having multiple engines and about having one engine, uh, the only downside with that is redundancy, one engine, and then you only need the scrubbers on the one engine, and that drives everything, including the hydraulics, except for on the ship. So there are there are things that we're all looking at to try and, I suppose, burn less fuel. Get, well, I had an Irish customer once, he wanted to, he wanted to, to hold more fish, go faster, burn less fuel, and he wanted it cheaper. So that's a uh, perfect, perfect client. I, I, I'm I, conscious. I'm conscious. We've, we've we've got a few a few questions coming in. Ken, I'm gonna I'm gonna drag. You're you're my super. You're my impact sub. Okay, excellent. Right. So um, we'll do our best to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, maybe just following up on what John has just said. Um, how well is data captured on the fuel consumption, spotting fish, and maximizing produce? Basically, how open is the industry in optimizing voyages, fleet, and smart cost management through technology and AI? You'll have, you'll have to run that past me again. I mean, <laughs> at, the end, at the end of the day, it's all about the bottom line. And if, if the guys are trying to get out there as quickly as possible, burn as, burn as little fuel as possible, and get back in as quickly as possible. But I mean, you've got whether you've got the fish are not always in the right place, you've got all sorts of things to contend with. But, I mean, that's what everybody's aim is. I mean, there's, there's tremendous benefits to be hit in the in new ships with, with technology. But then at the end of the day, it's say, uh, uh, you're, you're trying to catch, you're trying to catch fish. And you don't always know where they're at either. So, mm -hmm. um, I've got a quick one for you, Elspeth, from Stephen Patterson up in Peterhead. So he's asking, do you anticipate a landing obligation may now be introduced to require more UK quota to be landed in the country as a means of ensuring sufficient supply for the processing sector? Well, this is certainly something that the Scottish government um, consulted on back in, oh, I think 2019, they brought forward, a, I think they called it a national discussion on the future of fisheries management. 
part of that was uh, uh, ref referencing just exactly that type of uh, arrangement whereby um, looking to increase landings, I think in, in particular, uh, perhaps of, of pelagic fish. Um, that, cons that, that, that dialogue went on during 2019 and 20. Uh, at the tail end of last year, again, the SG published their, I think, policy on how they intend to take a lot of this forward. And there is still certainly a reference to encouraging uh, greater landings um, in, into Scotland. So that's still obviously in their minds. Um, we obviously have an election coming up. So we wait and see what happens post election in terms of um, what, what type of administration is returned and uh, what the priorities will be. But certainly it's, it's, it's something that's clearly still in the minds of government, yes. Okay, uh, to throw in another question, quite an open one, uh, Malcolm, you, you can direct it to who, who best answers it. Um, as a newly independent coastal state, are there any obvious lessons we can learn from the likes of Norway or Iceland? Mike, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, we were still not to discuss Brexit, but I, but I guess at least... You can but, if you want, we're just about finished. <laughs> the fundamental question, I think that that Iceland catch in the region of 80 plus percent of all the species in the waters that they're allowed to catch. And Iceland is about 90%. Uh, so we've allowed that horse to bolt and we can't now get back into that, that, that position. They do manage their fisheries well. And I think that's what we need to aim to do to make sure that the rest of the world see us in terms of iconic, not just in the quality of the product, but obviously in how we harvest the, the, the stocks and our sustainability credentials. Uh, the Icelandic situation is a bit of a grievance for me currently. They supply one third of all the, the cod and haddock in the fish and chip shops in the UK, and they do so tariff free, yet we get no access to Icelandic waters. So I guess, you know, what I'd like from Iceland and Norway, and what I'd like them to do is to, to give me access to more of their fish. That would perhaps solve some of the problems. Well, folks, I'm conscious of the time. Um, we've just hit 12.30 and I was in strict instructions not to be late. So I'm just going to say, Sincere thanks to Elspeth, Mike and John, and also to you, Ken. Um, I think that's been really worthwhile, a really interesting discussion. Um, as I mentioned at the start, it will be recorded, so there will be scope, I think, to, to view it on the Brodie's website in due course. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just say thanks again to the, the panellists. It's been really interesting from my perspective. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, having you on and hearing the discussion, and I hope you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.